when we open our Bibles, we go from the Old Testament to the New, we find ourselves coming in touch with some grand themes. And especially will we recognize those themes when we concentrate upon the New Testament. And one of those themes is God's grace. If it were not for God's grace and His favor upon us, not a one of us could ever be saved. One of those themes is the idea of the elect, that God before the foundation of the world had in His mind what His people would be like. And His election would be of a people that had certain characteristics and that would be connected with His Son in a certain type of way. And what one word that brings the elect and grace together is the word remnant. When we define remnant, we sometimes say, well, it's what is left over. We're thinking about probably the time of year where you'll have leftovers, turkey and things like that in a few days. And some of you may not like the idea of having leftovers, but it's a remnant. It's something that took place for the larger feast, and now there's a smaller portion. It's a portion left over. Hopefully, you will never find a remnant of hair in your turkey. But what is that? We will, that came from someplace. That's just a portion. It came from somebody, somebody's hair. I can't eat that turkey, but that's a remnant. And we might think it's leftovers, but... God says, no, it's special. It is the remnant. I want you to notice two passages of Scripture. In Romans, the ninth chapter, <clears throat> in verse 27, we'll find that Paul quotes from Isaiah 10. That Old Testament and New Testament are coming together. And he says in Isaiah, the 10th chapter, verse 22, of what he says here in Romans 9, 27. See if you see the big portion, and then you see why... He calls it a remnant, a remnant. He says about Israel, if the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, go try to number the sand of the sea. You can't do that. That's the point. If it becomes as the sand of the sea, it is a remnant that shall be saved. And in chapter 11 and verse 5, we'll read again, those themes brought together when he says in verse 5, even so that at this present time there is also a remnant according to the election of grace. The elect, grace, remnant. There is a remnant present, Paul says, in his time. And it wasn't just leftovers. Romans 9, 27, there is the remnant the remnant shall be saved, not a remnant. We see that in chapter 11. But here he stresses the definite article, a special people, the remnant shall be saved. It is a remnant saved by grace and is part of God's great plan of electing what his elect would be like. So I think those are grand themes and what we see is that Paul addresses that in Romans 9 through 11. And those are difficult portions of the book of Romans. I want to highlight those, those chapters because he is highlighting this remnant. And I want us to talk about it. Are you in that remnant that Paul says existed in Romans the 11th chapter? And you'll see why you need to be. And I think there's some lessons we can learn from the Old Testament as far as the remnant and the New Testament, of how, well, if we are considered to be the remnant, then what should we be like? And what warning should we take? So I want to go on that journey with you. And we'll, we'll hit that in a way that I think will be uh, important to us. When we think about the remnant, a larger portion of people, now there is a smaller portion talked about remnant. We've got to understand that Paul places such in a context of contrasting physical Israel with spiritual Israel. You might not think they exist, but the Bible says they do. 
Physical Israel, there's the Jewish people, circumcised the eighth day, and the flesh. And Paul addresses this. Notice in, in these two chapters, it tells you how much he cares for his brethren in the flesh. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience bearing witness with me in the Holy Spirit, that I have great sorrow and unceasing pain in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were anathema from Christ for my brethren's sake, my kinsmen according to the flesh. What are they? They are Israelites, he says. Who's in the adoption, the glory, the covenants? The old law was not given to everybody, it was given to his people, the Israelites. And the service of God and the promises that indeed of that coming from Jacob and Isaac, it will be a children of promise. But here they were, and he doesn't ever put them down. But he said, I wish if I could be separated from Christ, I would even do that to save my brethren in the flesh. But Paul is trying to stress being a Jew in the flesh is not being spiritual Israel. And look what he says in verses 6 through 12. But it's not as though the word of God had come to naught, for they are not all Israel that are of Israel. Let that sink in. They are not all Israel. He's now switching us to talk about Israel in another light. And he uses the description of the fact that, that Abraham, just because you're Abraham's children, doesn't mean you're Abraham's seed. He says, for they are all children, but Isaac, and Isaac shall thy seed be called. It was in Isaac, the lineage of Abraham, that that would be through whom he would call his seed. And he says, for this is a word of promise. When, he had, when Sarah was told to have a child, and that would be, a, a, Isaac would be that child of promise. Then notice what he says, for, for the children being not yet born, neither having done anything good or bad, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but him that calleth. It was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger, even as written, Jacob I love, and Esau I hated. So he gives Abraham that, well, it was a child of promise, Isaac, but even of Isaac. God elected that the younger would serve the older. It would be Jacob through whom the lineage would come. What's that illustration of? I am in charge, God says. I will elect. I will determine, not the way man looks at things, but the way I look at things. I, I am sovereign in my election. Then he goes on to say in this ninth chapter about who he's speaking about, that we are the, his, his spiritual Israel will be the children of promise. Now we pick up in verse 22. What if God willing to show his wrath? And to make his power known, endured with much long-suffering vessels of wrath fitted for destruction. What if he endured that and did something else? That he might make known the riches of his glory upon the vessels of mercy, which he foreprepared unto glory. He foreprepared his election that he would have vessels that would not receive his wrath, but they would receive his mercy. And that, that was what he elected. I'm electing a people that are going to be saved by my mercy. What if he did that? And he did that. What if, what, what, where does that come from? Verse 24. Whom he also called, not from the Jews only, that include the Jews in the flesh, but also now he introduces, introduces the Gentiles. And he also said, Hosea, I will call that my people which was not my people, and her beloved that was not beloved. And it shall be that in the place where it was said unto them, you're not my people, you Gentiles. He said, now you are people. You're called sons of the living God. And that introduces us to verse 27. I don't care if the children of Israel number as the sand of the sea. It is the remnant that shall be saved. Remnant, children of promise. Coming from the idea of the spiritual seed of Abraham, we'll see in Galatians, the third chapter, that 
Indeed, the seed of Abraham was the gospel preached that we could all be sons of Abraham and that we'll be vessels of mercy. And who did it include? Jews and Gentiles in both cases. Not only from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles and then from the Jews and the Gentiles, they would be vessels of mercy. And that's where he introduces himself into this idea of the remnant. Now let's add another piece of the puzzle. When he quotes from Isaiah 10, verses 21 and 22, he's in a context where God's people, physical Israel, will go off into Babylonian captivity. The northern kingdom went 130 some odd years earlier into Assyrian captivity and they were engulfed by the nations. They, they were dispersed throughout them. They didn't come back as far as a nation is concerned, but the southern kingdom did. That southern kingdom went into Babylonian captivity. It's in that context that this remnant will come, Isaiah says. This portion, not all of Israel as before, but this portion will come. Paul takes that and drives it in to application for, to include the spiritual Israel. So he says, as Isaiah said, if the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, it is the remnant that shall be saved. Vessels of mercy, children of promise, Old Testament prophecy being fulfilled through Jesus Christ. So we have to understand physical and spiritual Israel. Now let's add another piece. Physical Israel, as he enters into chapter 10, they are now a remnant, <coughs> the remnant that has come back from Babylonian captivity. <laughs> and they're not going to accept Jesus Christ, who Paul is arguing in Romans 9, that this is the way that how how the remnant should be applied, but they're not a part of it. They're seeking their own standard of righteousness. They're not going to submit themselves to the righteousness of God. And we see that in verses 10, 1 through 4. Because they fail to realize that Christ is the end of the law unto righteousness, to everyone that believeth. That's what we see in verse 4. That's spiritual Israel. It could be Jew, it could be Gentile. But the Jews in the flesh, they're rejecting Christ and they are establishing their own standard of righteousness. I'll just keep the law and yet Paul is saying, you don't keep it well enough to be righteous before God. And that's what we see in Romans 10 in verse 5. For Moses writeth that the man that doeth righteousness which is of the law shall live thereby... And this ad Galatians, the third chapter, verse 10, what should be the character of my living if I'm going to be justified by the law of Moses? He says, cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things that are written in the law to do them. That was the problem. Jews in the flesh had the law of Moses. But they could pick and choose and think they're right with God. And God says, the only way you can be right with me is to do all things that are written in the law and you continue to do them all perfectly. And no one did. But no one's bothered about it. Because physical Israel, that's where their mindset is. But in chapter 10, he begins to tell them, here is the spiritual Israel. It comprises of Jews and Gentiles. That you can know that Christ is the end of the law under righteousness. And so he said, it's not hard to find because it's the word of faith which we preach. And then we pick up in verse 9, because if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, Jesus is Lord, shall believe in thy heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Remember, we're in the context of Romans 9, the remnant shall be saved. Who's going to be saved? It can be Jew, it can be Gentile, it can be you, it can be me, it can be anybody. But we're going to have to come God's way in which he elected as, as vessels of mercy 
How are we going to have that mercy? We're going to believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. We're, sure, we're going to confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Who's being saved? The remnant. But this is how it's being done. In verse 12, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. It is in physical Israel, circumcision, the, the, the law, all of those things. But there's no distinction between Jew and Greek in spiritual Israel. For, the name, for whosoever calleth upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. For he said, for the name of the Lord uh, and, and is rich unto all that call upon him. So whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He's Lord both Jews and Gentiles. Paul is still stressing about the remnant, that it can be open to everyone. But physical Israel, the only way that they could become spiritual Israel is through Christ. But remaining physical Israel, that that's, wasn't going to get them to God. And this is Paul's argument throughout these chapters. And then the third main point of understanding physical and spiritual Israel is that he says, but they did not all hearken to the glad tidings. You could be a vessel of mercy. You could believe Jesus is the Son of God. Confess him with your mouth. Be involved in being holy. Call upon the name of the Lord. Appeal to his authority. But not everyone heard the message. He speaks about physical Israel. They did not hearken unto him. And he uses the Old Testament saying that you're going in, from, the, from Moses on, that there's going to be a nation that provokes you to jealousy. Let's run that theme for a few verses. We see in verses 19 and 20, but I say, did Israel not know? First Moses said, I will provoke you to jealousy with that which is no nation. No people, no nation. There would be the Gentile nations. With a nation void of understanding will I anger you. And Isaiah is very bold and said, I was found of them that sought me not. I became manifest unto them that asked not of me. But as to, as to Israel, physical Israel again, all day long I have spread my hands out to a disobedient and gainsaying people. Who would, be, who would find the Lord? He didn't send the law to the Gentiles. He'd be found to them. But they would provoke physical Israel to jealousy and be angered by that. And in the days of Paul, that was happening. But Paul is stressing this to get to another way that we pick up in verse 5, where he says that, verse 4 said, But what said the answer of God unto him? I have left for myself, 7,000 men have not bowed the knee to Baal. There's your remnant with Elijah's time. 1 Kings 19, when he was so distressed, thinking he was the only one. I got 7,000. He's got a remnant of Israel that hasn't done that. And he makes this application. Even so then at this present time, there's also a remnant according to the election of grace. If it's by grace, it's no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. What then? That Israel seeketh for, that he obtained not, but the election obtained it, and the rest were hardened. According as is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not see, ears that they should not hear, unto this very day. And David speaks about this will be upon themselves. They were in their own stupor. In verse 11, I say, did they stumble that they might fall? Was that God's purpose? Uh, they stumble, I just want them to fall. I want them to be discarded. No, physical Israel is never that way with God. He wants them to be coming over to be spiritual Israel. But by their fall, salvation has come to the Gentiles to provoke them to jealousy. The salvation has now come to the Gentiles to arouse them. I want the same thing. God didn't want to discard his people, Israel, but he's going to now switch to 
blessing a spiritual Israel as being the vessels of his mercy. That was what he had planned. That was his election, that people would be saved by grace through faith. And that somehow that the Jews would realize this salvation. I would rather be separated from them if I could. I can't. Romans 10 verses 1 through 5. I desire that my supplication of God that they may be saved. But the only way they could be saved is becoming spiritual Israel. And it was open to the Jew. It was open to the Gentile. That's what Romans 9, 10, and 11 are all about. To say, Jews, you need to come to me through Christ. That's been my purpose. That was my vision. And that's still a vision today because Paul says, we're here. The election is here. And, but that's the only way we can be a part of that. But now he speaks to the Gentiles. And he does it in a way of an olive tree graft. Pharaoh Jenkins took this picture, so I give him credit for that. It's grafting. Where you see a big root, and hopefully you see that there have been branches taken off this root. And there is the cuttings that have grown up of, of an olive tree. Now, when you look at verses 17 through 24, you, you, you look at that tree when I make some points about how accurate this illustration is that Paul uses, where he's speaking about Gentiles and Jews. And he, we pick up in verse 17. But if some of the branches were broken off, physical Israel. Remember, a remnant is going to be saved. If some of the branches were broken off, those were the Jews. That thou, he's speaking out to Gentiles, that thou, being a wild olive, was gathered in among them, and didst become partaker with them of the root of fatness of the olive tree. And he's going to drive home a point to the Gentiles. But the Jews were those broken off. It's not physical Israel. They're not going to be saved unless they become grafted themselves into the root. But that root of fatness is part of God's eternal plan of his people. And physical Israel hadn't gotten it, and they were cut off because they weren't going to be part of the fatness of this root. That's the point that he's making. But now the Gentiles are grafted in. We become partaker of them of the root of the fatness of the olive tree. Glory not, as he speaks to Gentiles, over the branches, but if thou glorious, let it, let it be thou that thou, it is not that thou bearest the root, but the root bearest thee. You see that, can't you? See the physical Israel, we are God's people. We are Jews, we've been circumcised. We've got the covenants. Messiah's going to come through us. And they were full of pride as thinking, we are the ones. No, the root bears the branches. Don't get carried away with the branches. Jews had a problem with that. And you Gentiles, you better not fall into that same category. Because it's not about you. It's about my election. It's about my sovereignty of choice. And you're going to have to come to the fatness of my root through Jesus Christ. They're speaking about this grafting process. He so said, that will say then branches were broken off that I may be grafted in? <laughs> Jews, they, nothing anymore because now I'm special? No, Gentiles, you're not any more special than Jews. Well, by their unbelief they were broken off. And thou standest by thy faith, but it be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, no, he didn't do that. He cut, he cut them all. He won't spare you either. Neither will he spare thee. Behold then the goodness and the severity of God. I think you can see that in that picture. That old root, still producing fruit. You can be grafted in and enjoy that blessing. But, but behold the goodness 
and the severity of God, they were cut off. Toward them that fell severity, toward them, toward thee, meaning the Gentiles, God's goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou shalt be cut off. Don't think highly about your fact that well, the Jews are out and Gentiles are in. It wasn't about Jew, Gentile. It's about God's election. And they also, if they continue not in their unbelief, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. You know, when you graft what you want to be produced, you take that cutting and you cut it away where you splice it with the root system. And then that species or that, that type will continue to, to grow as, as you, according to the cuttings you have. But it's just being supplied the, the nutrients from the root. And sometimes there's apple trees that have to be that way because they don't produce from seed the same type of apple tree. But this is the whole idea of grafting which he's illustrated. And it's very effective to get all the angles of Jew, uh, physical Jews and, and now what's spiritual Israel. But down to the Gentiles, don't think highly of yourself because you grafted in. If you don't produce, you'll be cut down too. And then he says in verse 24, If thou wast cut out of that which is by nature a wild olive tree and was grafted contrary to nature unto a good olive tree. Notice what he says about the Gentiles. You were a wild olive tree. Who would graft in a wild olive tree? That's against nature. There's no reason, there's no benefit of doing that, is Paul's point. You were wild, you're not, I don't want to cultivate more of you. I want this special plant. But I grafted you, which is against nature. For that's not the reason you graft trees. You want better fruit. So you better realize that you were just a wild olive tree that was grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, my root of how I'm going to save people. How much more shall these which are natural branches choose in the flesh? be grafted into their own olive tree. They just recognized the Messiah, believed in him, called upon the name of the Lord. They would indeed enjoy the blessings. What a vivid picture that takes in Gentiles in the flesh, Jews in the flesh, said, no, it's not about you in the flesh. It's about my election of grace and mercy. And you both are going to be grafted into my root. And what lessons does he teach us from that? There are two of them. We think about physical Israel. Why was there a remnant in the first place? What did Israel do to be cut down to size? They had forgotten that they were to be a holy people. That's why they went into captivity. And while just a remnant came out, they forgot that they were to be a holy people. They wanted to be like the nations around about them. They wanted a king. They started worshiping their gods. When God had taken them out of Egyptian captivity in Exodus 19, 4 through 6, he's about ready to give them the law of Moses in Exodus the 20th chapter. And he says this about them. From the mount, he, before he gives them that law, this is what he wants communicated to the people. Have you seen what I did on the Egyptians and how I bare you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself? Now therefore, if you will obey my voice, indeed, and keep my covenant, then shall you be my own possession from among all peoples. For all the earth is mine, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation." These are the words which thou shalt speak of the children of Israel. God wanted that emphasized to the people. And he's about ready to give them a law that they could follow to make themselves holy. I chose you out of all the nations. Again, his choice. But you need to be a holy people. And Isaiah 10 and verse 20 
speaks about the fact that they had turned away from a holy God in truth. That's why they're going off into captivity. Peter in the New Testament brings that same theme about being a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. Look at this in 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. When Peter takes <coughs> this point and drives it home to the Christians today. When he says, ye are an elect race. He's speaking to Christians now. A royal priesthood. A holy nation of people for God's own possession. That you may show the exes of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Notice what we've seen in Romans 9. Notice this verse, in, uh, verse 10 of 1 Peter 2. Who in time past were no people, but now are the people of God. Who have not attained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Vessels of mercy. Hosea speaks about they were not God's people. Now they're God's, God's people. He brings mercy and his grace and the people of God to be a holy people. And the lesson I want us to learn, that if we say, I'm part of the remnant. I'm part of the people that are going to be saved. That's wonderful. We've already seen, if you don't produce fruit that God would have you to produce, he'll cut you off too. Behold the goodness and severity of God. And we as God's people who claim to be part of that remnant, we've been saved by Christ, we come to him through faith, We've got to realize we can, we've got to continue to be holy. And Paul stresses this to the church in Corinth. When he tells them, come ye out from among them and be ye separate. And the Lord, said the Lord, and touch no unclean thing, I'll, I'll receive you. He's speaking a passage from the Old Testament to the Old Testament people. He applies it to the New Testament. And I will be to you a father and you shall be to me sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Having therefore these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Dear Christian, we're different from the world. And when we become more like the world, think like the world, feel like the world, act like the world, then we're losing our distinctiveness. And we're not pleasing the eyes of God. And we think, well, we're the remnant so did physical Israel. And Paul says, you spiritual Israel, you Gentiles that comprise that, God can cut you out too. And the lesson we need to learn, what caused there to be a remnant from a group of people? What happened? They forgot that they were a holy people. How you dress, what you do, where you go, needs to be communicating holiness. We're not going to worship like the world worships. Even like the religious world worships. We're going to worship God in spirit and in truth. And when everybody wants to be like the world, we're going to, what is the truth of the matter? How does God want to be worshipped? We did that this morning. We've been doing that. Every facet of our worship, we find Bible scripture for it in the New Testament. Because God said, that's my worshipers. We're dedicated to him. We've got to remain a holy people. Not in our private contact, uh, conduct, but our, our corporate worship. Everything that we do. Be ye holy, for I am holy. As Mr. Ed read from scripture today. And that's what we are all supposed to be uh, doing. That's lesson number one. And lesson number two. We're God's people by grace, not our own merit. There's the humility coming from the olive tree graft illustration. Paul says that we're saved by grace through faith. Not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. It's not about us that man should boast. But it's the gift of God. It's by his grace. Paul says, I am the chiefest of sinners. But if God saved me, he can a great example to them that will come to the Lord in faith. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 10, I am what I am by the grace of God. He worked hard. But I said, I am what I am by the grace of God. You are a saved Christian today. If that's you, by the grace of God. You had to turn from your sins. And we did not keep any law perfectly. But it's by the grace of God that we can be saved. 
There is holiness and there is humility to be learned from the concept of the remnant in the Old Testament and the New Testament. The question is, will you be saved? We might ask it that way, but we're looking at it this way. Are you part of the remnant? Remnant Jews, Gentiles. I think that would cover everybody. People are not Jews. They can be part of the remnant. And we should glory in that. And notice where our glory is founded upon. Look at Galatians 6, <clears throat> verse 14. When he says, But be it far from me to glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world hath been crucified unto me, and I unto the world. I'm not going to be like the world. I'm dead to the world, and the world doesn't like me either. For neither is circumcision anything or uncircumcision, but a new creature. Being a Jew in the flesh, that's not what it is about. It's being a new creature. And as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, whoever is in Christ is a new creature, if you're in Christ. And as many as shall walk by this rule, peace be unto them and mercy. And upon the Israel of God. That's God's people today. Vessels of mercy saved by his grace that's come through God through through Jesus Christ and when you think about this wonderful theme the Bible was written over centuries and with 40 different authors it wasn't one person writing the Bible you got Jeremiah in the Old Testament you got Isaiah in the Old Testament you got Paul you got Peter and yet they produce a unifying theme it's like you're reading one story. And we picked up on little themes of remnant and grace and mercy. And Paul brings forth illustration of the grafting of an olive tree. As if it's just one theme. Remnant is a portion of physical Israel. That was the Old Testament remnant, but it was pointing toward the remnant that God has had in his mind all along. It won't be because they're Gentiles or Jews, but for Jew and Gentile, they can be a remnant. And when 40 different authors over thousands of years writes a unified story, it tells us there's comes from one author. Because all different authors would not write the same story. Who lived and died before the other one lived and died. It's great evidence that this Bible is written by God. And what we've learned today is that there's a remnant in 62 AD that Paul was a part of that saved. And I ask you, you want to be a part of that remnant? We hope you do. We've already seen that those who believe that Jesus was raised from the dead and wanted to confess that with their mouth, that Jesus is Lord, shall be saved. Romans 11, 5, the remnant shall be saved. The remnant shall be saved. In Romans 9, 27, and in short, of course, 11 and 5. Is there any more that I need to do? Well, I've sinned. What do I need to do? I need to repent. That's what Peter said in Acts 2. When they were convicted of sin, <clears throat> they even had killed Jesus. What should we do? Oh, you can't do anything. You just did a horrible thing. No Jews in the flesh, Gentiles in the flesh. We've all sinned. But we can repent and be baptized for the remission of our sins, Acts 2.38. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, that which the Holy Spirit has promised through his word of salvation. To kind of bring that together, Paul says in Romans 10 about spiritual Israel, those who are going to succeed in life, they're going to be saved for eternity. What do they need to do? They need to call upon the name of the Lord. Whosoever, Jew, Gentile, calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How do I call upon the name of the Lord? How do you do that? Well, I'll tell you how Paul did it. Acts twenty-two sixteen. he was told to rise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. When you appeal to the Lord's authority to save you through his death and resurrection, you're calling upon his name. That happens in baptism. Like Peter said, repent and be baptized. And if you'll turn with me to Galatians, the third chapter, 
We'll close with this reading of these verses that brings it all together. For you're all sons of God. We're children of God. We're his people. We're all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ did put on Christ. There can neither be Jew nor Greek. Now you know why he would say that. Jew or Greek is not about that. Be Jew or Greek, neither be bond or free. I don't care if you're a slave or a freeman. There can be no male or female. I don't care if you're male or female. For you're all one man. Where? In Christ Jesus. And here's the point. Here brings this great theme together. And if you're a Christ, then you're Abraham's seed. Heirs according to promise. We'd be children of promise. Because we have come through Abraham's seed. Through Jacob. How do we do that? Not physical Israel. But by believing the gospel message. For in Galatians 3 and verse 8. The scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. Preached the gospel beforehand unto Abraham saying. In thee shall all the nations be blessed. Through faith in Christ. Obedience of faith in Christ. Confess with your mouth. Repent of your sins. Be baptized into Christ. You can be part of the remnant. And why is that important? The remnant shall be saved. So we offer the gospel to everybody. Those who are accountable to God. Whether you're male, female, slave or not a slave. Jew or Gentile. That's why we can freely offer this invitation. Because everybody needs it. And it's the only way that we can come to God through salvation. I hope seeing the remnant and election and grace brought together. It'll be brought together into your heart. That you'll have knowledge of what you need to do. And that you will be touched by the fact that the God of heaven lets you in on what he has been looking at from all eternity. And you think about that root of that olive tree, that's his root of fatness. That's what he had planned for election. And those torn out branches and this grafted branch and putting the branches back together again, we don't glory in them. We glory in that root. Take part of what God has planned for you. Obey the gospel right now as we stand and as we sing.